Okay, hi everyone. Uh, the striptease part was not an original part of the show. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Matej Guyash. I'm working as a co founder and a CEO of uh, Mbrightly. Mbrightly is a small uh, Budapest based startup with the vision to be the next generation uh, KPI and metrics platform for online advertisement, uh, for the online advertisement industry. So, our clients are uh, parties in the online advertisement industry, and we are an ad tech company which stands for advertisement technology, and our product is data-driven. Basically, we provide a dashboard and metrics for our clients. So data, data processing, and creating architectures for data procession is a very integral part of, of what we do. And uh, what, is, what is architecture, and uh, what I mean by saying how we design architecture? And I think there's not much difference between code architecture, uh, general infrastructure, or data infrastructure. I think the knowledge is different. So you need different knowledge for uh, data infrastructure and distributed computing because you have to think about uh, uh, skewed clocks and, and network partitioning. And code architecture is definitely different. But the mindset and the goals that we design for, I think, is very similar. So I always argue that having architects in a small organization and having developers is not really a good idea because I think everyone should be part of the, uh, the design, design infrastructure because they have the same mindset. You have to have the same mindset and also you understand the big picture better. And I see that people who are good in designing architectures are tend to be better in, are in, in uh, organizing code and designing code. So, in this presentation, what I really want to talk about is this uh, mindset, what we do design for. So what I think the goals and the, and the key points in designing architectures, and also our story, how we did and how we failed in some of the things that I actually teach. Okay, so what do we design for? And usually when you, when you, uh, when you uh, try to list what we design for, scalability, uh, maintainability, and cost is usually what people uh, talk about. Probably that wasn't the best idea to drink. So these are the things which usually people list, but I think they are not uh, the goal, they are the result of a good design. So scalability and maintainability are not something you should focus on, you should focus only on those things, they are their results if you have a good design. And I think what you should really design for is first of all simplicity, and the second is resiliency. Usually this comes up when you have distributed computing or distributed infrastructure, but this is something you should definitely care for. And small iteration, which is not part of how we design the actual infrastructure, is the process how we introduce those changes and how we introduce new architecture. And self-service, which is the organization part, because usually designing an architecture is not something you do on an island, but you do in an organization and you have to think about the effects and the impact that the infrastructure that you create or the architecture that you create has on the organization. So I'm going to talk about resiliency because that's a well-discussed and well-known uh, goal or a well-known part of designing architectures. Uh, it basically, the network, uh, the distributed nature, if you think about those things, you probably know a lot about resiliency. But the, the other three is something that people don't really talk about, and I think it's very important. So first, simplicity. Why I think it's so important, and even when I talk about architectures, or I talk about code, or different frameworks, I always come up with simplicity, because I think this is something we are not really good in, but still we should be really good in these things, because simple things scale well, and simple things are easy to understand, they're easy to reason about, so as a developer or as an organization, if you cannot reason about the architecture well enough, you won't understand the bottlenecks, what's the scalability issues, where hard comes, where things can go south. So if you don't understand, if it's not simple enough to understand, if it's not simple enough to basically have the whole structure in your in your mind as a developer, as an architect, the word that I don't like, then probably it's not simple enough. So I think you should strive to be more simple. Every time when you can make a simplification, you should do that. Because a simple architecture is usually better in many areas than a very, very complex one. And we're not really good in this. I think one of the reasons is because most developers don't have discipline. I don't have discipline. This is something we don't like to hear, but it's still true. We don't have discipline, we should practice that. 
sometimes you over-engineer things. I know I'm te I tend to over-engineer things. And uh, the way you could avoid that, or at least the way that I came up with and I, uh, I eventualize, is that you should think a lot about your architecture and how it serves the problem. And this, this is the second problem. People don't really, and developers usually, don't solve the real problems. They have kind of an idea what the problem is, but they usually overcomplicate that. And understanding the problem should be a very integral part of designing architectures. You should spend a lot of time understanding the real problem, the context, and the business around that problem. Because if you don't do that, you tend to overcomplicate things. And if you ever participate in any discussion when people say, okay, we should do that and that abstraction, because in the future we probably have that too, then you know what I'm talking about. So simplicity should be should be a, 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 the first goal and a very very important thing, and we should practice that. We should practice the discipline we need to come up with simple solutions that can still still fulfill the the, the purpose that solves the problem, but do not overcomplicate that. Part of simplicity is that boring technology is a good technology, and in the big data uh, ecosystem, this is a really good advice because. The big data ecosystem is basically this JavaScript of work for backend developers. Every week we have a new technology, every week we try to find a new technology and use a new technology. So now, last week Spark was the really cool thing. This week I did not check the news, so probably it's another one. But people try to use the latest one. But it's sometimes not the best idea to use the latest one, because all the technology is good technology, because you have a lot of... Uh, experience a lot of uh, developers who came up who came up with the same problems that you're facing so they probably wrote it on stack overflow or some other forum but all technology is good because there's a lot of experience with that and it's major and it, it's usually they are proven technologies what good example is MapReduce so everyone uses Spark now and MapReduce is, is, is legacy now this is the common sense but MapReduce is a great technology still for things like ETL systems and one-pass algorithms where you don't hold the data in memory, you just transform it and then you write it somewhere. And MapReduce is a great tool for that. It's not as sexy as Spark, but in many cases it's easier to understand, it's not as complex, not as magic as Spark, easier to optimize, and there's a lot of experience with that. So boring technology is actually good technology. Uh, small iterations. Why we should use small iterations when we introduce new architecture, when we design a new architecture, and to want to push that into production, for example. If you, if you studied how to do time estimate for software projects, you probably know this idea about the unknowns. When you, when you try to come up with an estimate, a time estimate for a software project, you have two different unknowns. The first one is the, the, basic, the basic unknowns. These are the things that I know that I don't know. So for example, I don't know how to solve a specific problem, but I know that I have to solve that problem to get to the, to the solution that solves the problem. I don't know if it takes one day or one week, but I know that I have to allocate time and I have to care about that problem. So I will allocate two weeks just to be sure, but I allocate it some time because I know that I don't really know what's the exact time it will take it will take me to, to, do that, to do that. But the other type of unknown is the unknown unknowns. These are the things that I don't even know about. So for example, if you talk about Spark, in our experience, what we, we didn't even anticipate is how much time we will spend with optimizing it. And a lot of problems came out from this thing that we couldn't, couldn't think about in advance about optimizing it. So we didn't even allocate time to this because we had no idea that it will need time. So the unknown unknowns is the big problem because you cannot even even uh, plan with these things. And when you, when you don't have small iterations, you have more and more these unknown unknowns. When you have small iterations, you don't have so many unknown unknowns. And basically, it's way easier to introduce new design and new architecture if you, have, if you do that in small steps. So what I mean, let's see this legacy uh, architecture when you have a network storage, a legacy R code pulls data from it, do some uh, data analytics, uses an ETL database to pull some other data, probably do some join, push the data back to the network storage, and a cron scheduler, which is the nice name for a cron job, uh, pulls the data from the network storage and then inserts the data into product database, which probably powers some dashboard or something. So 
This is the legacy you have to, you have to uh, scale. You cannot scale with the legacy R code, so you try to move to some kind of big data technology, and this is the design you came up with. This is a very pretty easy, straightforward. You have a Hadoop cluster, pulls data from a distributed storage, and then an ETL supervisor, which you usually have in a big data ETL pipeline, like Luigi or Ascobalt, workflow engine was a name for that, <coughs> schedules the, the Hadoop job and then pulls the data from the distributed storage and inserts the data into the product database. And usually the approach that most, people, most companies do is they basically do this greenfield development. They start to build up from scratch this new architecture, and six months now, they either fail or they push, try to push that new, this new greenfield uh, development into production but the old system changed. So they try to migrate the changes and then do that for another six months. So if you don't have small iterations, but you try to go from zero to the final product, to the Death Star, then there's a lot of unknown unknowns and also in the time until you develop, things will change. So small iterations means for me is if you come up with some kind of uh, uh, iterative uh, design. The first one is, well, let's just change the, dis the, the network storage. We can change that into a distributed storage. And if you see, only the API for the storage access changed. So the legacy R code is still there, the cross scheduler is still there. You can push the, that into production. And now you, can, you don't have the unknown unknowns for the distributed storage because now you push that into production, you fix the box, and then you can, you can move, on to the, move on to the, to the next phase which might be introduce the ETL supervisor because that's probably a new technology for you. So now you don't have to deal with the distributed storage unknown unknowns and the things that you don't know and the ETL supervisor. Now you only have to, do, have to deal with just the ETL supervisor. And when you push that into production, you can, tr you can try to care, of, you, tr you can uh, change the legacy R code for some big data technology. But when you're uh, this stage, the distributed storage and the ETL supervisor is basically running in production for a month now. And in the meantime, you, you, can, you, could, not, you could develop the, the, the big data tool that will replace the legacy R code, but the ETL supervisor and distributed storage is basically robust enough to run in production. And then you change that, probably we'll have to get rid of this one too. So the cross scheduler, we can use the Hadoop or Spark or any big data technology to push that into the database. And then the data that you pull from the ETL goes to the distributed storage and we arrive to the final uh, design that we wanted to build on the first place. So this small iterations gives you the, gives you the room and the, and the buffer to make mistakes with each part of the architecture. You push that into production, you run in production, and when it's robust and stable enough, you, dis you change another part of the architecture. It's, sometimes it's not as straight straightforward as this example, but, but you, you, can always have, you can always have these small iterations. And most companies don't do that. Most companies, and usually these are small, smaller companies, not big enterprises, but they go from zero to the Death Star, and if you know Star Wars, that's not a good story. Another thing is, is self-service. So what is uh, self-service? Your, your software IT infrastructure always impacts the whole organization. And when you, you're sitting in this ivory uh, tower and don't think about how the architecture will affect other parts of the organization, you usually forget self-service. I think self-service, which means that you basically provide tools for other parts of the company. You don't provide solutions, so you don't write the analytics uh, code for them and then just give them the, the CSV or the Excel sheet you give them tools to create those queries and then they can create the Excel sheet that they need. The good thing with this is that when you provide just data and you do the solution, everyone will have this small data analytics solution on their side, but when you give them tools, they, they get uh, familiar with those tools and use those tools. So self-service self is really important because this is the way how your, how your infrastructure can really affect, or data infrastructure can really affect all parts of the, or, of the organization. At Embright, we rewrite a lot of internal tools. This one is the, for our data pipeline, and this is not only used by the engineering team, it's also used by client operations and even by sales. Because they, it's easy to use tool, and they use this to check for data, for check for client reports and other stuff. 
And one good thing is that now they don't, we don't have, don't, uh, we don't have to uh, take time to create the solutions that our internal teams need. They can do that for themselves. So this is the IT version of, give, of don't give fish to a man teaching how to fish. Or in this case, it's sales and client operations. This is another tool. Now you probably don't, uh, you don't recognize the guy, but he was very famous two years ago. This is this tool is we check data. So this was an internal. Uh, this is an internal internal tool. Only the engineering team used it. Now all part every part of their organization uses it. Even investor relations uses this tool to provide APIs for investors. And this was how how I think you should really design architecture. Not all of the goals and not all of the important things like resiliency. I did not talk about that, but I think that's a. Uh, a more uh, depleted topic. It's a well-known topic, but so these are the things that I think is important. But most of the t sometimes not even us can can live up to those because sometimes we make mistakes. So how what we do and how our data platform looks like. So this is the product that we have. This is a dashboard. This is a simple uh, view of the dashboard. But you can see this is basically shiny and has data. And the data platform is the software that that sits behind this dashboard and provides the data that uh, this dashboard basically visualizes. One thing we use is Luigi. This is the ETL supervisor or workflow engine that I mentioned. Uh, this is basically the, the glue that uh, glues your pipeline together. This is what schedules uh, Python analytics. This is what schedules Hadoop jobs. This is what checks for data dependency and other stuff. We had some extensions. We we're also contributors to, to Luigi. It was originally created by Spotify. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of internal tools. Not because we think Luigi is not great, it's just Luigi for developers, and we want to enable this part of the infrastructure to be available for non-technical people, like, as I mentioned, client operations, sales, or marketing. So we create a lot of tools around it, so non-technical people can use it. We use Spark, we have quite a lot of data, it's a big data, you have to <laughs> tell how big your data is. Because this is how you know. Because how this is how people know that you actually have big data, and also the reason why we should have more women in tech. We don't talk about sizes that much. With Spark, we spent three months optimizing it, and I will get back later. So when we started, when we started with Spark, we could create the I think the initial prototype in two weeks, and then spent two months optimizing it to achieve the specifications that we needed. Yeah, and we have not cost and, and the only thing why, uh, not the only thing, one very important thing why I recommend Spark is because it's so easy to write tests. And because, you know, obviously we have 100% code coverage, but um, we didn't write tests before that. And one of the reasons, not all the reasons, but one of the reasons was because with Python, we had a monolithic Python analytic script basically. It was really hard to write scripts, but with Spark it's really easy. And we use AVS. But it's not that important. So this is a very simple architecture and the reason why I'm showing you is to see that we really thrive, we really want to create a simple uh, architecture, which is just not too complex because things will go south. Almost any part can can uh, can go down have problems, and when you have many parts of the architecture, the the probability that something will go south is just a magnitude order bigger when you have just three or four, four parts or four different uh, tags in your in your architecture. So for us, this is really easy, really simple. We use, as I mentioned, Luigi. We push and we read and write data from S3, which is an Amazon storage system. And then we use MySQL, which is also it's a boring technology, but it's a well-known, well-understood, and it's a good technology, and it's a robust technology. Facebook uses it, and Facebook never goes down, so my, MySQL is good. At least this is my understanding. <laughs> and to talk a little about how we got there, and this is the use case and the failures. The reason why I'm trying to show you and to look for the failures, I'm going to show you the timeline how we how we uh, went from from a monolithic Python application to a, to a big data uh, stack. Um, the, look for the failures, look for the things that I did not follow based on what I already told you. And the reason why I think it's important because 
we're very afraid of failures, and we think that you have to get right every time, but I think this is not the case. You won't get everything right all the time. Most of the time you should get right, but, but I made really stupid mistakes, and I think it's important to be very explicit about those things, because especially people who just start with this thing that you should get everything right all the time, but that's not true. It's, it's, it's okay to be wrong some of the times because this is just part of the job. So this is, this is the thing that when we were, we were wrong. So we started in 2014, that was when we started the whole company with the Monotic Python analytics. It was really ugly, it's still ugly, but we don't use that now. In, two, in, in two, uh, January 2015, we started to evaluate big data technologies, which means basically I tried to rewrote some parts of the, of the data analytical pipeline to, to cascading, to crunch, to spark, to Hadoop, and then it stopped, and in 2015, September, we started again, but only using Spark, and it took us from September to February to get this to production. And the original time estimate for, the, for this project was, uh, was two months, which you can see that did not come out quite well. So what's, what's the things that we missed? You're too far to be interactive, so I'm gonna give you the answers. So one thing that we missed is we had we did not use small iterations. We wanted to build the whole Death Star. We had a better ending, but it still took a lot of time. Also, the other part, simplicity. We failed with that on the first uh, try because we wanted to cover all the use cases. We even thought about what if we need SQL integration. This was part of the reason why we actually chose Spark. And the spoiler, we don't have SQL integration. So, and the other part is that we, we, we started with Spark, and I, had, I was the only one who had Spark experience. The other guys had no Spark experience. So basically I was the only one who knew the technology, and we started to use Scala because no one knew Scala, and we thought that's a good match. <laughs> it wasn't. So after, Two weeks, I think we switched to Java, but still use of new technologies. So the, the target that we tried to reach was too big. It, we had no small iterations. It wasn't simple, and we did not really consider the problem that we tried to solve. This basically this was this greenfield development when we thought that basically now we'll cover like hacker news. And now for the future. In, in 2016 July, we will have this SaaS data platform, which means that uh, what we try to do now is that the data platform is basically a service for internal users, like client operations, like sales. So we don't want to integrate clients uh, from the engineering team. Sales and client operations can do that. Obviously, the way that leads there is to have a lot of automation and a lot of internal tools. This is the SaaS service approach. The last thing, the thing before the last thing is to have fun because this is this is sometimes it's not easy sometimes it's frustrating designing architectures but one thing you should keep in mind that you should always have fun because at the end being a software engineer and writing all those things is it's really fun so you should have fun in the meantime and practice at home because we write code at home we have hobby projects I've got hobby projects but it's usually just writing code we never practice designing architectures at home even though you should you should try and came up with architectures and, and even implementing them at home. And now it's not even that hard because you've got the cloud and IoT and mobile, but you've got the cloud and, in, and you have all these credits that you can get from Amazon, from Google, and you can just spin up servers for free basically and try to came up with different architectures that you're interested in or you just want to try. And if you fail at home, it's not a problem. But you can practice, and so this is something which I always tell people, especially students, that it's not just code and coding and writing single CPU applications that you can try and practice at home. You can do that with, architect with, with data architectures or architectures at all in general. So do that too, to take data architecture, or designing infrastructure and architecture the same way you do coding. Because I mentioned at the beginning, it's actually not that different. You can practice that at home, and the same mindset and the same goals can be uh, an important thing in designing architectures and designing code too. And also we are hiring. 
Because we need people, we try everything, this is one of the dogs that now it, we're basically training to code, not too much success. So please. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs>